So thanks everyone for joining us here today. My name is Zach Wagman and I am PLT Canada's Senior Green Jobs uh, Manager. Uh, and today as part of our learning session for employers, uh, we're gonna be learning about how to create a safe, supportive and empowering green job space for urban youth. I'd like to now introduce our presenter for today, Leanne Knoll. As the Executive Director of the Canock Institute, Leanne is in charge of coordinating and supporting all research projects and environmental education programs affiliated with Canock, while ensuring that they meet their long-term vision of sustainability and conservation. This includes the direct supervision of their internship program and celebrates women in science and gives students an opportunity to actively participate in real hands-on biology research. SFI and Project Learning Tree Canada are proud to have worked closely with Canock over the years, as they have been a strong SFI partner and SFI certified organization. Canock has also been a green jobs employer through PLT Canada's Green Jobs Funding Program since 2018. And with that, I will pass things over to you, Leanne. Perfect, thank you. I will just share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yep. <laughs> okay, great. So hi all, my uh, my name is Leanne Knoll. Um, like Zach said, I'm the Executive Director of the Canock Institute. And I'll start off by just giving you guys a bit of background on what the Canock Institute is so that you guys can have context for uh, my suggestions. And again, um, it's a pretty short presentation. So if you guys have any questions or, or anything to add at the end, uh, there'll be lots of time to do that. So the Canock Institute is a charitable organization that was established in 2014. Um, we're located on a property called Canock, which is in Montebello, Quebec. It's uh, kind of halfway between Montreal and Ottawa. And it's one of the largest private uh, nature reserves in North, North America with 65,000 acres and 60 lakes. So it's a pretty big property. <laughs> Um, our mission with the Canuck Institute is to support scientific research projects and then also create environmental education programs, um, all with the long-term goal of con conservation. And uh, our mission is to establish a baseline inventory of um, all the species that are on the property so that we can monitor it long-term. Um, we really, our goal is to monitor the property uh, for climate change and human impacts really long term, so 100 years. Um, I offer an internship program. Um, my internship program is to support women in science, and so I hire undergraduate biology students or environmental science students for the summer, and they really have four main tasks. Their tasks are to just help the Canuck Institute with our day-to-day -day operations. That could be anything from clearing trails to painting to helping me maintain equipment. They also help with all of our research projects from outside university partners. Um, they're expected to lead their own independent research project, which can be for credit for school or it can just be um, internally for the Canuck Institute. And they help me teach our educational programs as well. Really, I'm trying to create an internship um, program that gives my students uh, a lot of experience in a lot of subjects so that they can figure out what they're extremely passionate about. They can get a lot of experience and hopefully pursue that in uh, graduate school or in their careers going forward. So I came up with a few strategies for supporting uh, urban youth and rural uh, areas. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some, so if you guys have any to add at the end <laughs> or any questions, please feel free. Um, so I'll talk about uh, setting the right expectations, um, what kind of resources that we can give students or youth, um, what to do for accommodations, food, uh, some suggestions for scheduling and entertainment as well. So first is uh, by, you can really have uh, support, support urban youth in rural areas by starting out with the right people. So um, if you hire the right people, it, things will already <laughs> go better for you. So I find that it helps to be really clear about what the students or the youth can expect. So I, I really, um, in all my uh, descriptions, internship descriptions, the application forms, even during my interview, I'm really honest and clear about the isolation, 
the bugs, the heat, all of that fun stuff. In fact, I try to oversell it because I know that if a youth is still really excited after I mention all those things, then they're probably the right person for the job. Um, I also create a really specific um, application form that's geared just for my uh, internship. So on that application form, I ask questions that really help me. Do they have a driver's license? Um, do, do they have first aid? What are their emergency contact information? And also I like to learn anything about their medical conditions or allergies, just because I'm so far away from um, emergency uh, like hospitals and um, first aid that I really like to be informed. So I like to know those things ahead of time. Um, if a youth has a deadly allergy to bees or wasps, it's probably something you wanna know before they, they step foot in, into your forest. Um, also, I like for them to be well prepared before they arrive. So I've created a really uh, detailed packing list that I put up on the screen there that will help your youth a lot because if they show up with the right equipment, then um, they'll be a lot happier. So, you know, things like bug jackets and having uh, water bottles and the right kinds of clothes, it will help them a lot to be able to deal with um, a lot of the new elements that they've probably not experienced before. Um, resources, so internet <laughs> is a big one. For me personally, we don't have high speed internet on site where the interns live. So I try to organize for them to get uh, access to high speed internet at least once a week so that they can contact their families. I find that's really important for them to be able to uh, do video calls, send pictures, videos, um, get in touch with their families and let their families know that they're okay and they're having fun. Um, also transportation, uh, because we're in such a rural location, it helps if they have access to a car or at least a few of the youth have access to cars um, so that they don't feel trapped and they have the option to leave the property if they want to or need to. Um, for accommodations, um, provide summer long accommodations. A lot of uh, my interns or my youth they don't want to go home on weekends because they live particularly far away. So um, making sure that they have a space to live all summer long, not just during their weekdays, but also on weekends and that they're comfortable and able to stay there um, all summer is really helpful. And if you can try to allow for some private space, I know that's not always easy, <laughs> but um, a little bit of private space can go a long way for uh, making the youth feel comfortable. For food, that's a little bit of a complicated one. I'm sure everyone's in a, a bit of a different situation. Um, like I said on my application form, I like to ask about eating restrictions and allergies so that I know ahead of time and I can prepare. My personally, my preferred method is to not provide food for them, is to have them provide their own food. I tried to provide food for them in the beginning and it, it was so complicated. So what I do now is I actually have the interns, I have a small group of interns, only six, uh, usually around six, um, six youth. So I have them take turns grocery shopping and meal um, planning together. They make lists and they cost share this, the cost of food. Then they also have the opportunity to um, buy their own snacks if they want. So they, uh, they take turns grocery shopping, they split the cost of the food, and they prepare meals as a team. So often breakfast and lunch, it's um, everyone for themselves, but suppers, they take turns preparing the meals. So uh, I find that's the easiest for me. And it also teaches the youth a lot of really useful skills like meal planning and cooking and cleaning and working as a team. Also, something that I've learned that helps is at the end of every summer, I have all the youth write down uh, their favorite recipes from the summer so that I have a bit of a, an intern recipe book going at this point. That helps if the interns by the end of the summer run out of meal ideas or they get bored or they, they need some quick and easy meals, then they just dive into that, uh, that re intern recipe book. And uh, it's also an opportunity for them to kind of leave their mark and, you know, Pass, pass on what they learn to the, to the new youth. Uh, schedules, this will also depend on every job, but I switched to a compressed work week a few years ago and I like that a lot. So my interns actually work four days a week, Mondays to Thursdays, um, and they work very long days, Mondays to Thursdays. 
This gives them three days to go home because it's such a long drive. This allows them to go home if they want or get out and explore. It gives them a bit more time to do that. Also, because they're working such long days, there's less downtime during the week for them to get in trouble or get bored or <laughs> go out exploring and, and do things like that. So I find this strategy works really well for me. But um, even if it's not a compressed work week, you can just try and adapt your schedule so that it, it matches your, your needs and it will make the youth happy too if they can go home sometimes on weekends. Entertainment, um, keeping the, the youth entertained. Sometimes they won't be used to doing a lot of uh, the activities that are in the rural setting. So um, I like to facilitate some of these activities in the beginning. Um, what I do is I have the interns or the youth write down a bucket list of fun activities that they want to do at the start of the internship. And then every week when we're making our schedule, they choose one bucket list activity that someone takes a turn facilitating or making sure it happens. So for example, this week we're going to have a games night and this youth is in charge of making sure there's games and providing snacks and all that stuff. So that's something for them to look forward to and plan and it, it uh, again just keeps them entertained. Also, I offer one professional development session every week. This is again, the youth get to really tell me what they want to learn about and I do my best to facilitate that. It might be a little bit harder during COVID, but it also helps me learn a lot if I have to teach them about writing a good CV or how to use Excel, then, you know, those are things that I learn as well. So I let them tell me what they want to learn. I provide them with some, um, some suggestions and then they choose a professional development session every week that they want to learn about. And that's something that's useful to do. You can do in the evenings or if it's a really stormy, rainy day that you can't get outside and do... Um, do the work that you need to do, then I also take advantage of, of that time. And yeah, so those are all of my suggestions, but uh, I'm sure people have other suggestions of how they can support support uh, urban youth. And I, I'd love to hear, hear about those. Perfect, thanks Leanne. And yeah, all participants uh, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself if you have any questions or type them out in the chats. Um, I've got one question though, Leanne. Uh, I'm wondering if some employers in rural locations may overlook urban youth. And so I'm wondering if there's any qualities um, that youth living in urban locations tend to have that might help them on the job. Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Certainly there's, uh, they're, they're kind of a blank slate in many ways. So they, they come in and they're ready to learn. They're usually really excited to be outside. So I find that really useful because I can teach them all of my safety ways, all of the ways that I like to do things. And um, they're there to absorb and learn. And uh, certainly I don't find that hiring urban youth has given them any limitations in any way. Usually they're, if, the, if the individual is eager and ready to learn then they'll do anything to learn. They, uh, they're not limited, that's for sure. Excellent. Uh, I see Robin has a question. You can unmute yourself, Robin. Yeah, uh, just to, to chime in to support there. Uh, so once I've uh, selected a youth uh, before they commence employment, I offer them to take the uh, level one first aid training. Uh, so I pay for that training if they're willing to do that in advance. And also, uh, uh, they, they, pre-employment, I make sure that they agree um, that they will participate in a bear aware training. Because out here on the West Coast, bears are a big issue. And I don't want to take anyone that isn't trained in using the bear spray and the proper techniques around bears, because they're encountered often in the work that I'm doing. And also, uh, uh, in their pre-employment, the stressing the, um, the rules under WCB, um, uh, the workers' compensation, especially the, the right to refuse work if at any time they feel they're put compromising and putting in an unsafe position. So, and I also have them sign a, like an employment contract as well to make sure that they're clear of all the, um, everything from the salary to all the other details or whatever regarding uh, uh, employment. Excellent. Thanks, Robin. 
Uh, as we wait for a few more questions to come in, Leanne, I'm curious how many of your interns um, that come from a urban setting continue on in a, in a rural profession after an experience at Canuck? So far, all of them. <laughs> uh, pretty much 100% of the interns that I've had uh, come back summer after summer and then go on to do a master's program in biology or some kind of outdoor field. I've had just a few that go on to vet school or medical school, but most of them really do stay uh, stay in the green jobs sectors and employments. And a lot of them now are actually doing their PhDs and I'm sure will be far more successful than I ever was. So <laughs> it's really cool to see them go on and do that. Uh, yeah, it, it, feels like, it feels like it's really a good stepping stone for them to get a placement during the summer in the green jobs sector. And, they develop their passions and then they'll, they'll, they'll pursue those for sure. Definitely. Do you have any trouble finding candidates and where do you typically post your positions? I do not have trouble finding candidates. If anything, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with candidates, especially this year. It's been crazy. The number of uh, applications that I've gotten. Um, I usually go through the universities. So um, I have a lot of partnerships with uh, McGill, Concordia, Carleton, Ottawa U, all the universities that are in my area, I'll contact their, um, they usually have job placement coordinators that I've developed a relationship with and with a few of the professors. And then they go on and um, they spread the word about my internship and I do not have problems finding students. There's, there's tons of qualified people out there for sure. Excellent. Does anyone else on the line uh, have any questions or want to share some of their tips or experiences in, in terms of hiring youth from an urban location? I actually had a question, Zach. Uh, Go for it. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask if, uh, if you faced any uh, barriers or difficulties uh, ever since the pandemic hit uh, in getting the youth to work with you or has anything changed? because of the pandemic? Uh, a few things have changed, but that's one of the benefits of being in a rural location is that we're already very isolated. <laughs> so um, the way that I've gotten around that is my internship program has continued on um, almost as if it's normal. So I had interns last summer and I plan on having interns again this summer. Um, I have the, uh, the youth quarantine for two weeks before the start of the internship. And then this year, I think I'll even be able to ask them for a negative test. And then once they're on, on site on the property, I know they're safe once they're here because we form our own um, little COVID bubble and there's no outside influencers here. And because we're so rural, we're so isolated. Um, last summer, I had a lot of success. We, ha we haven't had any COVID here yet. So I'm hoping we'll be able to repeat that again this summer. <laughs> but good question. Yeah, for sure. It, I'm sure it depends on the jobs, but uh, being rural, like I said, you're already at an advantage because we're already quite isolated. Leanne, I know you mentioned in your presentation that um, internet was a factor when working uh, on the Canuck property. So is that something that you have to um, get internet service on site or do you take folks off um, into, um, I guess, a more urban space to get that internet connection? So getting better internet on site is actually impossible. It's not, if it was possible, I would definitely do it. Um, but so I have to take the youth to the internet. I can't take the internet to them. So um, we have a main office, which is where I am right now actually. So I just organize to make sure that all the, uh, the youth can get to our main office. I book a conference room for them and make sure they have a few hours so that they could every week so that they can talk to their families. Um, most of the time they're happy to be without internet uh, on site. They're, they're happy to disconnect, especially these days. I've been hearing a lot of my, uh, the candidates that I've been interviewing saying they're really excited not to have internet and not be um, on video calls and in classrooms all day. So um, I think they're excited about that, but making sure that they can connect with their family is very important. So um, I just organized to make sure that I take them somewhere that has high speed internet once a week. That's great. I see Mirna has her hand up. Uh, Mirna, do you want to ask a question? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. I was just wondering in terms of uh, career path. 
So when once you have these people, you have them come over and like move from an urban setting to a rural setting. How do you like from your experience? Did you feel that people were more willing to actually permanently stay in these remote areas? Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of them do want to end up staying as long as um, you can provide them with the comforts like good accommodations often um, also accommodations that provide space for a spouse if you're really looking long term that's that's really important but um, a lot of them want to stay uh, most of them I'd say would, would love to stay um, working and living in a rural setting they, uh, they they like that lifestyle yeah and in terms of career path do you think it's something that um, would help them in the future, like if they stay in these remote areas? That's a good question. Um, being in a remote area, I'm sure you get a lot of experience um, and all, you gain a lot of skills that I'm sure will help them in their future career paths. I do encourage most of my youth, just because I'm in the biology and sciences sector, I encourage most of my youth to go on and do a graduate school program it seems like that's really necessary these days. So a lot of my professional development sessions are also geared towards um, how to get into a grad school, how to choose a good master's program. Um, is a PhD right for you or do you want to get work experience? But so far, all of my interns have gone on to do master's programs. Um, some of them at on site with me, some of them at other universities. But uh, so I think that for sure it helps them take the next step. If they have that, that hands-on experience, that's essential to get into grad school. So I think that's important. And then they have me to write them recommendation letters. I write a lot of recommendation letters. That also makes a huge difference. And um, they, they stay in touch. All of my interns <laughs> stay in touch a lot. They continue asking for advice. And uh, it's really fun to hear the success stories and where they end up going. For sure. Have uh, a lot of your interns, did they know they always wanted to go down this path or was it something that they stumbled upon a little bit later? Uh, some of them they've known since they were very young, but I'd say most of them actually, it's something that they stumble on a bit later. A lot, I hear it a lot that they didn't know that the, you know, there were job opportunities in the green sectors. A lot of them also say that's something that their parents don't necessarily understand or support because it's maybe a little bit new to them. So I'd say that a lot of them didn't realize that these were, there were so many opportunities working outside um, when they were younger, but learning about it in, sometimes it's a trip they did or something in school, but uh, once they figure out that that's their passion, they, they stick to it. Excellent. Do you have any other questions in the chat? I might start calling on people if we don't get uh, any others. I see, uh, John, I'm not sure if you were clapping or raising your hand there, but uh, if you were raising your hand, feel free to un unmute yourself. Yeah. I, I'm unmuted now. And yes, I, I am raising my hand. I, I, I'm not used to Zoom. So we use we tend to use Microsoft Teams in, in Ontario parks. But uh, so I was, I was looking for that hand everywhere. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I just wanted to, that's a really interesting uh, uh, organization that you have, Leanne. It's a really, uh, really, really interesting setup, and I, I appreciate some of your tips. Uh, there were there were a few there that I made note that I, I want to share with my colleagues for sure. Um, part of our challenge, I, and maybe there's not much of a question here, but I, th I think more of a comment. Part of our challenge as an employee um, employer with um, Ontario Parks with the Ontario government is that we, um, we uh, use an online system for receiving um, applications. And, and that is used for all of our provincial parks across the province. So there's, there's a tendency there to sort of generalize uh, what our expectations are and what, um, what the various job uh, titles are with regards to students, which I think uh, unfortunately leaves a lot of opening for confusion. Um, and, and I think part of that is, uh, you know, folks, uh, youth are, are, are applying uh, for these jobs and they could be going to Quetico Park or they could be applying for, 
you know, and, and the parks all are all very different. Uh, my park, the park that I manage at Wasaga Beach, is a very rare circumstance where it's a park within a town. We're completely surrounded by a, uh, a very active uh, community, beach community. Uh, but then we have parks up in the northwest or the northeast that are quite isolated. Uh, so that you, you get all these different things. And I don't think, I, I think often the youth will just apply for, you know, all these different parks, hoping to land a job somewhere, but not really understanding that there are certain things that they need to be thinking about and accommodations is a huge one. Some parks have st staff housing, other parks don't. And, and for a student to come into Wasaga Beach in the, in the summer months and actually afford uh, the rent that, you know, that, that some of these places, these, accommoda these accommodations go for is completely unrealistic. So often we end up hiring uh, students that are from local families, right? Um, because they have a, either a family home or a cottage in the in the area that uh, they could use, so it's it's a very interesting challenge from our perspective, um, and I and I, I fear that we we don't often, uh, you know, unless we have a student that's coming back, we don't often prepare them well, and 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 um, you know, and there's not a lot of a lot of necessary supports in place that um, that. Uh, a lot of youth need in order to get into these uh, jobs for the first time. So it, it's an interesting challenge. I think I think it's more of a comment that I'm offering here than than a than a question at this point. Um, I, I was interested though in your your roofed accommodations, uh, Leanne. Um, uh, some of them look quite unique from the photographs that you were showing. Actually, quite quite cool. Yeah, so I mean, I, th you make a really good point. It would be really hard for us. Um, we also live, uh, the Kanak is in an area where we don't have that many families in the area. And um, if they had to be able to try and afford rent in the, in the nearest town, I don't think it would be possible. They'd be paying more in rent than I could afford to pay them. So um, I, I ended up buying what they're called pods. They look like little hobbit houses. Um, I don't know if you guys remember seeing it as a picture in my presentation. I can pull it up again. Um, but so providing on-site accommodations has been huge because it just gives you a lot more flexibility. These are these are the little uh, the pods. <laughs> so they're they're pretty affordable and um, they're small, but it just gives it uh, the youth a place to live on site because that would be a real challenge, John, to to not have accommodations on site to, to be able to provide that. So this is what I was able to do. I'm sure there's lots of different options, but um, really the youth don't need much. They just need a place to crash. Um, it's there. The pods are certainly not luxurious, <laughs> but they're comfortable. So the youth are happy. But um, also I, I feel for um, the general job, job descriptions that you were talking about, that would also be hard to try and narrow down the kind of youth that you hire if there's just one big general job description. I like to get really specific with my job description to make sure I am hiring the right people. So that would be a challenge for sure. Yeah, no, thank you, Leanne. The other comment I'll make is, um, and I know one of the, um, employers here ask the question about uh, what changes the, the pandemic has, has caused. And I know from our perspective, and I certainly, and I won't speak for Ontario Parks on this one, but certainly from my local park situation, uh, one thing I really noticed in 2020 was we, we couldn't do our, our staff orientation session where we bring all the staff into a big hall and we go through a variety of different training sessions that we provide on customer service and we provide background on the park itself so that these youth coming in um, get that perspective, that training, so that when they're asked by a, a visitor, uh, by a patron, uh, some basic questions, they're at least uh, in a position to provide those answers. Um, and I really, because we couldn't do that training, I really noticed it in our organization in terms of some of the issues we were dealing with and some of the confusion by our public um, by our visitors, uh, and, and they weren't getting the, the, the supports that I would, uh, you know, we would have been able to provide in the, in the past. Uh, and of course, 2020, because we were just swarmed, 
uh, we, we were just overrun by, by visitors. It was uh, a very, very unusual year. And I think we're looking at uh, the same thing in 2021. That's it, I, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> no, I no. It's a these are great comments. It's a good discussion, and uh, I understand. It's also I also offer offer a lot of. Um, for for example, I used to offer wilderness first aid. I wasn't able to do that last summer because of COVID, so that definitely was a little bit trickier. But hopefully, it's temporary, and we'll be able to go back to think how things are <laughs> normal one day. But uh, yeah, that that's definitely tricky for sure. Great, thanks for that. I, I see we have a good diversity of employers from all over Canada. Um, and I, I see we have Ingrid Mickle from West Fraser on the line. And I was just wondering, Ingrid, from a West Coast perspective, are there similar um, items that you deal with when recruiting? And do you also find that you have the same um, accommodations to be made if you're hiring urban youth? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we are in that same boat where basically all of our operations are, um, they're in the north. And so, you know, the campuses are more in urban centers. And it's, you know, the question is, how do we attract people to, to come to that? Um, you know, for this, the forestry summer students, it's a little bit easier because generally there's always groups of students in the different locations. So we kind of pitch it as, you know, it's an adventure, like everyone's gonna be in the same boat. You're gonna really get to know people. Um, we also offer a housing subsidy. So that helps a lot because, you know, these students are saving up for their tuition. So in this way, you know, it's like, okay, well, great. So you don't have to worry about housing that way. And then while we don't actually have staff houses, housing, because we hire people, um, you know, every summer, we kind of know all the contacts. So we put people in touch with the contacts and things just kind of work themselves out. So we've never had a student that couldn't join because because they couldn't find accommodations or anything like that. Um, so yeah, but it's definitely a challenge to to get people, you know, to, to come up north. And also when you look at forestry in BC, there's other locations that are on the island, you know, that are more attractive to youth than maybe coming to some of our remote locations. So definitely in the same boat as uh, everyone else on this call for sure. Thanks Ingrid. Yeah. Is there anyone else who has uh, questions or comments they'd like to share? It's been a really great discussion, discussion so far. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would like to ask: Is there is there a network that you have built so that the youth uh, who is planning to uh, start the internship can connect with the youth who has previously been a part of uh, this internship? So that would help uh, them get oriented better or ask questions uh, and get to connect with them. Yeah. So from our perspective, it's um, super informal. You know, we're just basically like, we'll ask everyone if they're okay with it. You know, as we kind of start getting into closer to the summer season, you know, we ask people, are you okay with um, sharing your phone number and email? You know, and everyone's always open to it because again, if you have roommates, it's gonna mean your cost of housing is a little bit less and things like that. And so I think because the atmosphere is really friendly, people are open to it because um, it's an advantage, right? And I mean, for us, we've had, We've had woods managers go look at apartments for students and like send them pictures and stuff. So, um, you know, on a big scale, it sounds kind of daunting because we hire 50 to 60 students, but each location, the most we would have is maybe 10. And so then that's way smaller and easier to manage. So, you know, you're just on the list with 10 people. And I think students are open to, you know, just that additional help, right? Like, so um, it's worked out well for us. Uh, which is which is positive for sure. And Leanne, I noticed you had mentioned that there was a, a cookbook that was created with year-over-year uh, -year recipes. Is there other, I guess, best practices that get shared from one year to the next? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So, for example, my uh, my intern packing list. I have the youth from the at the end of the summer. I have them comment on that packing list to see if there's anything that they wish they had brought during the summer. A lot of my documents actually have the youth review at the end of each summer. So even my 
uh, internship description, my application form, is there anything they wish that they had seen in the job description or anything that they wish I had told them during the interview. So I have my youth comment on those documents every year so that they get better and better. Um, also, I have um, a Facebook group and uh, a WhatsApp group for all of my past interns. So um, I have the interns that I'm hiring, they're able to reach out to past youth or past interns and ask questions. And then throughout the summer, I have them post pictures and they reminisce and they're like, oh, I was in that pod too, or um, so that's good. And then the, the youth that have gone on to do graduate school and PhDs, then they can come back and actually help me facilitate some of uh, my professional development sessions about what it's like to get into grad school, how to pick the right professor and all those things that they hear from someone who's been through the exact same thing that they have. Because as I get older, I get more and more out of touch with those systems. So it's useful to have past youth that have gone through it recently come back and provide advice. Perfect. And I, for these youth that are coming to Canuck, it it is a pretty remote area. Um, there's a question in the chat about how do you mitigate team bonding issues? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, providing um, the, the youth with some private space can be helpful. So for example, my pods are really tiny, but they are private. So if, if someone's having an issue, they can always go and have some alone space. I find that makes a huge difference. But um, I also switch up the, the teens every day. So not the same youth are working with the other youth. Um, so for example, there's no clicks that can form. I, I like to switch it up so that everyone's working with someone different every day. So there's not that opportunity for things to get really bad. But so far I've been really lucky to be honest. Um, I guess they're all really like-minded individuals. So uh, they've gotten along pretty well. And the ones that don't necessarily get along well are able to be patient and just, you know, be nice and cordial, but not, just not necessarily stay in touch long-term, but. It's a good question. It's definitely a challenge. Definitely. I, I think we have time for one more question. I see Mirna has uh, her hand raised. So go ahead, Mirna. Uh, you're just on mute. I don't know if this has been done already, but I was wondering about the urban youth who are still at a high school level. And uh, we talk a lot about uh, awareness, about accessibility. I was just wondering whether any efforts have been deployed in order to raise awareness from an early age for all these youth who live in urban areas who might be interested um, in rural like opportunities, but they never just got the chance to know about them. That's a good question. So I've actually developed what I call my junior internship program. Um, it's one week and it's high school students that come onto the property and I pair them with my interns so that uh, I have my undergraduate students who are my interns teaching my junior interns who are high school students. So that gives my um, undergraduate students the opportunity to mentor someone and it gives the high school students a chance to get some of that experience. That internship is only one week long. It's not the entire summer, um, but it's just you that think that they have a passion in biology. They don't know necessarily. Um, they've never experienced that. So they can come on and do a one week uh, junior internship with, with the Canuck Institute. And that's been really popular for my interns too, because they get to take like a young high school student under their wing and teach them everything that they have to know. And I do that at the end of the summer so that at that point, my interns are pretty experienced with the job and um, you know, th they feel confident teaching, teaching those high school students. That's just one idea. I'm sure there's lots of other ways to, to get in touch with, with high school youth. It's a really good point. Definitely. And I, I think with uh, green jobs increasing in demand in rural locations over the coming decade. Um, we're gonna start to see more and more demand for youth from urban environments. So it's, it's important to have these conversations and share these best practices to ensure that these are positive experiences for urban youth to ultimately keep them going in that direction. So I, I'd like to thank Leanne uh, so much for joining us here today. That was an excellent presentation. And everyone on the, on the call participated as well. We had some really great discussions and collaborations there as well. But again, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today and uh, we'll see you in the next session. Thank you, Zach. Thanks.
growing future forest and conservation leaders.